Amen. If I haven't had the chance to meet you, I go by aunt. I serve as a pastor here uh, at Midtown Tuna. I'm very glad you chose to worship with us this morning. Uh, we're doing something a little bit different from what we normally do today. We're not in a sermon series uh, per se. This is more so uh, we had one, one Sunday in the year uh, that was kind of in between sermon series where oftentimes when that happens, I like to kind of kind of look at our church, consider our church, and just think through and pray through, really, uh, God, what would you have for us to focus on based on where we are as a church, based on maybe our strengths, maybe based on our weaknesses? What is something that would be good for us to get our eyes, our minds, and our hearts on uh, today? And today, and I'm, I'll get to the scripture in a little bit, uh, I want to focus on how do we pursue growth as Christians, but even more specifically, how do we pursue growth in areas where we might feel or seem stuck? When there are areas in our lives where we're wanting to grow, we're desiring to grow, but it seems like we're making very little progress in growth in the Lord and in pursuing maturity in Christ. How do we grow in the Lord? How do we grow out of the, the traps or maybe the bondage that we feel the enemy has us in? Let's jump straight into it. John chapter 8. I'll start at verse 31 again. It reads, so Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. So he is talking to some of the Jews, some of his people, and he lets them know that if they, if they abide, if they dwell, if they live in his word, then they will truly be his followers, be his disciples. And if his word remains in their heart and in their mind, and if they live by his words, then they're truly his followers. Verse 32, and you will know the truth the truth from his word, of course, and the truth will set you free. They answered, and we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? He's like, not only will, if you, if you abide in my word, and if you know my truth, and if you follow me, not only will you be my disciples, but the truth that you find in me will set you free. So they are, they are confused. They don't understand what Jesus is talking about. They're talking about... The, According to them, and from their perspective, they're already free. So they don't understand what Jesus is saying to them. So Jesus says this in verse 34. Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. So in response to their question, when they're questioning Jesus and asking him, what do you mean we will be made free, we will become free? He points out anyone who practices sin is enslaved to sin. More on that a little bit later. Verse 35. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And so he's, he's talking about how in their culture, obviously, uh, there were different forms of slavery that were taking place. And he's letting them know, but if you're a son, then you're, you're in the house. You're with the father. You and him, you're, you're always with him. So if you're going to be set free, you need to be set free by someone who's already free. And that's the only way that you will actually find freedom. So he's saying, he's talking about himself because he is the son of God. He is free from sin. He's never been enslaved to sin. He's never practiced sin. He's saying that he is the one that can free us from slavery to sin. So for the next handful of verses, Jesus is like, y'all, he basically tells them that they aren't of God because if they were, they wouldn't be trying to kill him. And they're like, we are of God. And he's like, no, God is not your father. He says this starting in verse 44. You are of your father, the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the what? Truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. For he is a liar and the father of lies. I got a few points for us today. If we're going to understand how to not be ensnared and entrapped, and, and if we want to understand how to walk in the freedom from slavery to sin that Jesus offers us, one thing that we need to know is that the devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. I don't know what comes to your mind when you think about spiritual warfare and the battle between God and Satan, but when it comes to how Satan leads us into sin and how he leads us away from God, the biblical picture here of this battle between God and Satan is often centered around the devil lies to us and God tells us the truth. The devil lies to us and God tells us 
the truth. God gives us an honest picture of reality so we can perceive him and perceive ourselves and perceive the world around us accurately. He lets us know what's good, what's righteous, what's beneficial, and what's not. And he shows us how we should treat each other. The devil, also known as the enemy, is a master deceiver. Deception and lies are his native tongue, is what Jesus is saying. And like all good liars, he doesn't just tell you things that are blatantly and clearly 100% false. He tells half-truths. He twists the truth. There will be some truth in what he says, but he is always looking to distort that truth in some way. And in a much more damaging way, in a much more damaging way, it's kind of like the, uh, the mirrors like at the fair or at a carnival. Right, the fun mirrors. You go in, you see the mirrors, and you can see a bit of what's going on, but it's always distorted. But you're never actually getting a true representation of yourself or whatever is around you, and you're getting a representation of it that's distorted, that's off, that's disproportionate, that emphasizes the wrong things. This is how the enemy attacks us, where he gives us a distorted picture of what is there, and he leads us away from the truth of God through his half-truths. We won't turn there for the sake of time today, but in Genesis chapter 3, when he is looking to tempt Eve, he tempts her by, by telling her and quoting to her in some ways, maybe twisting it a bit, what God said. Right? He doesn't just come in telling her what she should do or what she should believe. You know, what is he? He's bringing up to her, yeah, God brought this up to you, right? But didn't God say blank? It's a twisting of the truth. It's not just a lie that's completely separate and distant from anything that's real, which allows him to be even more deceptive and allows him to, if we are not careful and very aware of what the truth actually is, it allows him to be more effective in deceiving us. I mean, you got to think about it. He comes to Jesus in the wilderness quoting scripture. He's quoting the word to the living word of God. This is how he goes about trying to deceive us. Jesus obviously responds by quoting scripture back to him, but he's, he was twisting the scripture to try to get Jesus to do something that the scripture would never have called Jesus to do. He twists the truth. He, he bends the truth. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 says, And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So he uses disguise. He wants to, to come across as if he is for our good and our benefit. This is the primary way that he looks to attack you. He wants to play on your desires to make you think that the truth that God presents to you isn't actually true. And he will use whatever he can to deceive you. He uses whatever he can to get you to believe something that is in opposition to God's word. He'll use your past. He'll use your past to keep you from believing the truth. The things people said about you or things that people have said to you, he'll use those things to keep you from believing the truth. Things that have happened to you, pain or maybe trauma that you've experienced to keep you from believing the truth about God and yourself and others. He'll use your preferences. He'll use the fact that you deeply desire the word of God to say A, B, and C. And he'll use the fact that you desire that so strongly to cause you to be in denial about what the Bible actually says. Well, I just can't believe the word of God would want me to do that. Even though it's clearly in the Bible. He'll use the fact that you have a worldview and an idea of how the world should be run and what should be allowed and what shouldn't be allowed. And when the Bible disagrees with that worldview, he'll seize that moment and whisper to you, God can't be trusted. He'll seize that moment and whisper to you that what we see in the Bible, that's not actually true. And the lie underneath the lie that he's slipping to you is that God won't disagree with you. That's what he's actually telling you. If you feel this strongly about something, obviously you're right. God's not going to disagree with you. So that's, that can't actually be what's being said in the word of God. Family, if you only believe the stuff in the Bible that makes sense to you and that you can wrap your mind around, it's not the Bible that you have faith in, it's yourself. If you only believe the stuff in the Bible that makes sense to you and that you can wrap your mind around, it's not the Bible that you have faith in. It is yourself that you have faith in. It is your mind, it is your ability to understand, it is your ability to reason, it is your own personal views on morality that you have placed your faith in. 
The enemy will use your ignorance. He's quoting scripture to Jesus and misapplying the scripture so he can get Jesus to, to test the Father. If he'll do that to Jesus, he'll use your lack of study and your lack of meditating on God's word to get you to believe something that isn't true. Often as Christians, we build our beliefs on Christian cliches or our favorite worship song or traditional sayings that we've never checked with the Bible, that we've never checked to actually see if that's what the word of God is talking about. He will prey on us because of our unwillingness to truly search the scriptures. The enemy uses whatever he can to deceive us and keep us from truly knowing, truly and truly knowing, excuse me, and following God. And he leads us to sin in the process. I want to be clear about something because I think sometimes people have a misunderstanding of the objectives of the enemy that Jesus is talking about here in John chapter 8. His primary goal is not to keep you from reaching your goals. His primary goal is not to keep you from being successful in your endeavors. His primary goal is not to keep you from enjoying the pleasures of this life. His primary goal is to deceive you and lead you into sin. Even if that means letting you reach your goals. Even if that means allowing you to continue to pursue whatever it is in your mind and your heart that you want to pursue. I want us to read a verse in Proverbs chapter 30 that I think helps us find some balance and maybe have a better understanding of God's will for our life versus the enemy's will for our life. Proverbs chapter 30 verse 8. This is a prayer from the author. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Some of y'all ain't praying this prayer. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me. So I want to make sure I understand what he's saying. He's saying, don't give me too much and don't give me too little. Give me what I need. That's, what, that's the request of God in this prayer. Verse 9, lest I be full and deny you, saying, who is the Lord? He's saying, unless I have too much and begin to place trust in the riches and the wealth and the power and the influence or whatever it is that I have and don't see a need for God in the same way, don't give me too much, lest I be poor, or sorry, excuse me, or lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of God. Also, don't cause me to be so poor that I turn away from you. The, the, the desire, the, the heart of the author of this proverb here is, God, you know what's best for me. Give me what is best for me. Even if that is different from what I personally desire for myself. The devil isn't just trying to keep you down and hold you back from being successful. He'd love for you to be successful if he can lull you to sleep and cause you to forget about your need for God. Or he'd love for you to be poor if that causes you to not trust in and follow God. I remember one time when I was in college, I was, was, was a part of a ministry there. And one of the things that I noticed um, a lot of times, and when you're, when you're in a ministry in that age group, a lot of times uh, people uh, in, the, in the ministry, men and women, will be attracted to, to each other, start dating and things like that within the ministry. And so one of the things uh, that I started noticing was a lot of the times, and I you know, had more conversations with the brothers in the ministry about this, but a lot of times we be praying for uh, a godly relationship, a relationship that, that, that points them to Jesus and helps them grow in their walk and all that. Uh, and then they were getting a relationship, and then their, their participation with the church or ministry decreased. The amount of time that they will spend in the Word decreased. And in general, their, 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 their commitment, their focus, their dedication to following God and walking with Him decreased after the relationship. The enemy is so intentional and focused in on his mission of leading you away from God and leading you into sin, that he would literally use the thing that you pray for, that he would literally use. And, and, and if we're not aware, if we don't have a heightened sense of awareness as to what the enemy's plan truly is, because if, because if we don't look at this correctly, we might think anything we pray for, well, what the enemy wants is for us to not have that thing. And what God wants is for us to have that thing. But the enemy and, and, and the way he works is such that he'll try to use whatever situation or circumstance, even the blessings that God gives you to lead you away from God and lead you towards sin. I read that scripture to raise our awareness of the enemy's methods. Don't just see him as someone that's trying to keep you from getting where you want to go. See him as someone who is scheming to deceive you once you get where you want to go. 
so that he can get you to turn to sin and away from God when you get there. I've seen this happen in people's lives before. I've seen people get the promotion that they wanted. The promotion came with extra responsibilities. The promotion came with extra stress. The promotion came with extra work hours. And all of that combined led to this specific person I have in my mind now no longer being as disciplined in meditating on the word of God, no longer being as consistent in spending time with God in general and being around Christian community and fellowshipping with other believers. I believe for some of us, Satan would love for us to pursue our goals and dreams and aspirations because I believe he's tricked enough of us over the years to know where some of those goals and some of those dreams would lead us. That is why the, 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 the prayer that, we, that I read in Proverbs chapter 30 is so important and so sobering for us. God, you know best. God, give me what I need. Don't give me so much that I would turn away from you and don't give me so little that I would turn away from you. Psalm 23 verse 3 says this. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Paths of righteousness. God, all these things would be nice, but my desire is for you to lead me in paths of righteousness. Even if that's not the path of ease and comfort and all the temporary pleasures in this life that I want. And brothers and sisters, let me say this. If you can't pray that prayer, you've already been deceived by the devil. If you can't pray that prayer, God, lead me down the path of righteousness, even if it's not down the path of all the goals and all the desires that I have. If, you, if that's not one you can go to God about, he's already got you. He's already got you deceived because you are already valuing the temporary pleasures and blessings of this life more than you value the righteousness that God desires for you to practice and walk in. He's already deceived you. He's disguised himself as an angel of light as he plays on your desires for good things. Then he's going to play on the fact that all the, and he plays on the fact that all those things are good and he just distorts them in a way, or, 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 or maybe he knows that the, the way that you would see them or perceive them or desire them might be more than you desire righteousness from God. And thus he twists the truth. He distorts sometimes very good intentions that we have because he deceives us. And before you know it, he'll be using that blessing to get you to sin and decrease your tendency to follow God. That's how he works. He uses the lies to get you to sin and doubt God. He'll slip you a lie that God isn't trustworthy. And when things in your life aren't going the way you thought they'd go, you, you, you panic or you experience more stress or heightened anxiety and worry. And you're afraid about today. and You're afraid about tomorrow. and You're worried about the next day. And now you're feeling more and more anxious than normal because you're trying to find a way to control everything. And underneath it all, you believe a lie from the devil that you're more trustworthy than God is. He wouldn't say it to you that way. You would just feel inside yourself a need to, to try to control everything and work, maybe, maybe work yourself, your fingers down to the bone to try to make everything go the way that you originally intended for it to go instead of just trusting God, maybe resting and knowing that what God has for me is for me, knowing that God is trustworthy. So you're, you're, uh, oftentimes our lack of peace and our inability to rest in God's plan and God's timing shows that we think we should be running the show of our life instead of God. We worry. We don't trust God. Why? Because he, he, the, the enemy used whatever he could to feed us a lie that God is not trustworthy. And he leads us into sin and worry through that lie. He'll also use areas of weakness in our lives, in our lives, excuse me, to lead us to sin. Some of us have believed the lie because of weaknesses that we have that we cannot change. The devil has slipped us a lie that the way that we are now is the way we're always going to be. That God can't or just won't grow us in this area of weakness in our lives. He tells us, look at how many times you failed and, and sinned in this area against God. It's pointless to keep fighting. I mean, at this point, you should just give in. It's going to happen at some point anyway. And this often leads us to sin, and then it often leads us to justify our sin. Some of us have, let's say we have anger issues, and we respond to our anger in sinful ways. But if we get to the point where we no longer feel like we'll grow out of this, 
You hear her say things like, oh, that's just my personality. Y'all know how I get. Y'all know how I get. That's just my, that's just my personality. You know me. I'm just a worrier. You know me. That's just how I am. He'll use our weaknesses to feed us his lives. Or sometimes he'll use our strengths to feed us his lives. You have an area in your, in your walk with Christ that you're maybe stronger than others, an area that's a strength for you as a Christian. Maybe, maybe let's say you're more zealous than, than others, maybe about ministry or, or, or serving others or sharing the love of Christ with people. And the enemy will use that to tell you that you're superior to others who aren't as zealous for those things as you are. Even though you have weaknesses in areas that they have strengths, he'll, you, he'll highlight your strength, cause you to, to look down on others and think you're superior and others are inferior and lead you to the sin of self-righteousness and use your strengths to do it. The enemy uses lies to get you to doubt God and to get you to turn to sin. Unless we think that those lies are harmless or that your sin is harmless to you, our next point is this. The devil's lies enslave us. The devil's lies enslave us. This is what Jesus is showing us in John chapter 8, verse 32. He says, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And if the truth sets you free, that obviously means that the lies are what have you bound. Verse 33, they answered him, we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? They're like, Jesus, we're not enslaved, we're not bound. And Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. One of the overarching points of this passage and others in the Bible is that the lies of the enemy leads us to sin, and thus they enslave us. And the thing that sets us free is the truth that we find in Christ. And we'll get to our freedom in Christ for, for our third point in a second, but for right now, I think before we can fully appreciate that, we need to have a depth of understanding about how the enemy's lies lead us to sin, and that sin then enslaves us outside of Christ. God's Word shows us that sin is much deeper than we tend to think that it is. If we make sin our practice, then we are actually practicing bondage and slavery is what the Bible is saying. The enemy wants you to think that when you choose sin, you're simply choosing satisfaction or pleasure or relief. But the truth, but the truth is, when you choose sin, you choose slavery and bondage. The enemy wants to use deceit to enslave you to sin. I know you had this thought before. I know I'm not the only one. Well, I'll just do it this one time. I'll do it this one time. I ain't going to do it again after that. I'm going to repent and I'm going to follow Jesus and I'll, I'll, never, I'll, I'll never do it again. And then, and then how often, how often after that does that temptation come back just as strong, if not stronger, the next time? 100%. Why? Because, because we, can, we can look at sin and think, well, all this is really about, the only thing that's going on here is I'm just trying to find some type of fulfillment or satisfaction or relief or whatever it is right here in the moment. But the, but the scheme of the enemy and the nature of sin is about slavery, not about what happens just in that moment. It's about bondage. It's about captivity. That's the way the Bible talks about sin in a variety of passages. And he uses his lies to lead us towards our own bondage and captivity to sin. Yes, there is, there is often satisfaction in the moment when you believe the lies that the enemy tells us. But sin always enslaves more than it satisfies. Sin always enslaves more than it satisfies. I want us to notice what the Apostle Paul writes to the Colossian church in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive. Notice how, how, how he's saying the people of God can be taken captive. By philosophy, that's a way of thinking, a way of understanding, a way of perceiving things. An empty deceit that's being deceived by something that, that is hollow at the end. According to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. He's saying that philosophies and deceit take us captive, that they bind us. Uh, anybody in here like to fish? Anybody like to fish? Yeah? Good. I don't, and I'm horrible at it. Uh, I'm glad you do. Uh, I don't have much experience at it, right? I'm not good at it. But even in my very basic understanding, of fishing, here's what I know. 
that oftentimes the method is simple. Let me take something that you like and something that you want and make sure you see that. And let me make sure you don't see the captivity that's coming along with it. Let me make sure you don't see that you're going to be captured by this thing that you're pursuing and you're not going to get out of it what you thought you were going to get out of it. And, and in, in addition to that, you're going to experience some amount of bondage that you didn't anticipate experiencing. And when you do that, when you use that method, you could actually get the fish or Christians or whoever to move directly towards their own bondage without even realizing it. That I don't even have to overpower you. I can just lure you in. And if you're a Christian here, and, I, and let me say this, uh, especially if, uh, for maybe Christians who haven't been Christians for a very long amount of time, or you're just starting to really follow Christ and trust Christ and that kind of thing. Let me say this to you. One of the things that you need to know from the beginning, even if you don't have an extremely high amount of knowledge or experience as a Christian, is that this is what the enemy does. That there's always a hook under the bait. That every single time there is a hook under the bait. He, his, his desire for you is never for you to actually experience the joy and pleasure and fulfillment that you desire. You can still know the bait. Even if you're not the most mature Christian, you can still know the basics of what the enemy wants to do to lead you away. He wants to show you the things you like and hide the thing that captures you. And one of the reasons that it's so difficult to turn away from sin, I believe, is because our actions are determined by our beliefs. I'll say it again. Our actions are determined by our beliefs. And it's, it's difficult to change very deeply rooted beliefs or deeply ingrained beliefs. You ever met someone who, for a variety of reasons, has just come to the, has come to the belief about themselves that they just can't achieve? If you ever met somebody who, who, who's like that before, that they've just maybe that's just been told that a number of ways. It is incredibly difficult to uproot these ingrained beliefs that we have from lives that we've lies that we've believed about ourselves over and over and over again. And one of the reasons it's so difficult to turn away from sin, one of the reasons that sin is so enslaving to us, is because it's not as simple as I know I need to stop, so I'm going to stop. Because the sin oftentimes is rooted in a deeply ingrained belief that we have that the enemy, because the enemy has been feeding us lies over time, time and time again. To, to undo deeply ingrained beliefs, you can't just muster up the willpower to stop believing those things or stop doing it, but it, re, it requires training. It requires an ongoing commitment to the process of training ourselves to think differently about ourselves, think differently about others, think differently about God. And this is often a very challenging oftentimes frustrating, oftentimes a very daunting amount of effort that we have to put into it. But praise God that we know the one who is the truth. Amen, church? Amen. Point number three, Jesus' truth is greater than the devil's lies. Jesus' truth is greater than the devil's lies. Second Corinthians chapter 10, starting at verse 3. I love this verse. It says, for though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. We're talking about spiritual warfare here. That's the topic. Verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. So a stronghold is a, a military, military term that they would use uh, to describe a fortress. It can even be used to describe a castle, something that is very heavily fortified, something that is very, very protected and hard for an enemy to come in and invade or take over or conquer. It's somewhere that's very well defended. And so he's saying in the spiritual battle that he's talking about, a stronghold is a place where the enemy seems to be in control. Maybe in your life individually, maybe in the life of, of, of Christianity on a larger scale, a place that seems impenetrable, a place where it seems like you can't win, an area where you've fallen for his traps and his schemes and chosen sin over God over and over and over again. Here Paul is saying that we actually have weapons to fight with that are empowered by God himself to destroy those strongholds. So he's saying he's giving you a picture of an area that's so heavily fortified that it looks like it can't be beaten. And then he says, but you have weapons from God that are empowered by God to be able to even destroy the strongholds, the fortress, the fortified place that seems like it can't be destroyed. And the apostle is going to tell us how to deal with these strongholds, how to deal with this captivity, or, or, or maybe another way of saying it is he's going to show us how to walk in the freedom that we have in Christ from slavery to sin. 
So if you have any areas in your life that you identify as strongholds, the Apostle Paul is about to tell us how to destroy those. Verse 5, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive, every thought captive to obey Christ. I don't know if you noticed this or not, but Paul just equated those strongholds with arguments with beliefs, with with reasonings and judgments and decisions and ways of understanding. If we want to destroy strongholds that the enemy has, we need to, through the power of the Holy Spirit, destroy the arguments that led us to the captivity. Destroy the reasoning, the distorted truth that led us to captivity and and take all of those thoughts captive to obey Christ. We need to be mindful of what thoughts we are believing and accepting. And we should be taking those thoughts captive and destroying them by causing them or bringing them to obey Christ. Because family, if you aren't taking your thoughts captive, your thoughts are taking you captive. If you are not taking your thoughts captive, your thoughts are taking you captive. And he says we should take the thoughts captive to obey Christ. I read earlier uh, John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32 it says, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We find freedom in the truth by using the truth of God's word to expose and reject the lies that the enemy tells us. I'll say that again. We can find freedom. We can find victory over strongholds in our lives by using the truth of God's word to expose and reject the lies the enemy tells us. So when the enemy tells tells you that God isn't trustworthy and you need to try to control everything in your life to make sure that it goes the way that you want it to go, when you start feeling more and more worried and more and more anxious because you can't make your life pan out exactly the way you want it to go, you can destroy that stronghold in your life by reminding yourself of verses like Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. You can look, you can look to what Brother Matthew tells us in Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 30, where he says, But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Or when you're discouraged in your fight against sin because all the times you succumb to temptation, you start to feel like giving up because the enemy is feeding you the lie that you're not going to grow, that God, is, that God will never change you, so you might as well just give up. You can look at verses like Romans chapter 6, starting at verse 10, says, For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. You can destroy strongholds in your life by reminding yourself that because of the death and resurrection of Jesus, you have died to sin and are and now are alive to God to follow him. And you are no longer enslaved to sin. That that's not who you are anymore. You are a new creature in Christ. Family, one of the, one of the best and most fruitful practices that you can have as a Christian is actually two parts. It's identifying the lies that you tend to believe from the enemy. And then finding truth from God's word that helps you take those thoughts captive and make them obedient to Christ. Being in the consistent habit of doing doing those two things is a practice that will be about as fruitful as anything that I can think of for you as a Christian that is looking to, 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 as the Apostle Paul says, destroy the strongholds that the enemy has set up in your life. I think for all of us, if we're honest with ourselves or maybe if we take the time to think about it, We can identify strongholds in our lives. And I think also for many of us, if we're honest about it, we haven't been vigilant oftentimes in identifying what are the lies that are leading me to this sin time and time again. What are the lies that the enemy is feeding me that I am believing that keeps leading me here? And then what is the truth of God's word that I need to be believing in place of the lies that the enemy is telling me? Sometimes I just feel like as, as Christians, do we, do, have, have we stopped caring about waging war against the strongholds in our lives? 
Is, is, is our love and our faith in Christ such that it will lead us to consistently over and over again remind ourselves of the truth of God's word, that the truth might set us free as God desires for us to live and walk in his freedom? I'm reminded of Psalm 119, verse 11. I'll read in the New King, New King James Version. It says, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Family, don't get me wrong. This isn't some type of magic formula where if you memorize enough scripture, then you'll never sin again. But I would say over time, as you commit to reminding yourself of the truth of God's word that combats the lies that the enemy is using to have strongholds in your life, God uses that to grow you over time. He uses that to mature you over time. He uses that to free you over time. As Jesus said, the truth will set us free. Now in our journey as Christians, it takes time to identify those lies. Oftentimes we find it difficult to keep reminding ourselves of the same truth we need to remember over and over and over again. Here's my pastoral encouragement to you. Do not try to do this alone. Do not try to fight against the strongholds in your life alone. There's so many Christians that are continuing to, to live in this, this, this bondage to sin in part because we're trying to fight it on our own. Maybe we're trying to manage our image. We don't want people knowing what we're really struggling with. We don't want people knowing, and maybe you, we're afraid that they'll think less of us if they truly know what's going on with us. So we're trying to fight against these strongholds on our own, and soldiers were never made to fight alone. Soldiers were never made to fight alone. Soldiers are made to fight together, to wage war together, to wage war for each other, to wage war with each other. Stop allowing yourself to experience more bondage than you have to because you're so afraid of what someone's going to think of you if they know what's really going on with you. And your, and your fear of the, of the expectations, your fear of the perception of other people is causing you to not experience the freedom that Christ has for you. My encouragement is do not try to fight against these strongholds alone. My encouragement would be to not only identify the lies that we tend to believe, to not only try to look for and find out what, what truth, where's the truth in God's word that I'm not believing to help bring these thoughts captive to Christ. My encouragement to me, to you, will be to take a step further than that and share both of those true things with others, with those in your life group. Here are the lies that I find myself believing. Or like, hey, I, I continue, maybe it's, maybe you phrase it more as a question. Hey, I'm continuing to struggle with this. I, I haven't been able to, 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 to mature in this area. I haven't noticed maturity in myself in this area. Can you help me maybe figure out what lies I might be believing that are keeping me bound in this area? One of the things that we, one of the resources that we provide for you in our life groups, if you notice towards the end of our life group guide in the review the mission section, there's a link uh, to a resource that just has different scriptures, different truths from God's word, but it categorizes them in relation to or regarding the different struggles that we have or the different false things that we believe. So the goal is that when, when we are able to identify maybe some of the, the lies that we believe from the enemy, to be able to equip you with and give you scriptures that you can turn to time and time again. My recommendation would be when you find them, it's like, yes, this is what speaks to exactly what I'm dealing with. This speaks specifically to the stronghold that I've been fighting against. My, my recommendation to you is not only, not only you memorize those, but let those in your life group know, hey, these are the scriptures I need to be reminded of. A lot of times as Christians, we value accountability and accountability for uh, and, and checking in on us. Uh, have we turned to this sin? Have we done this? Have we done that? I want us to also hold each other accountable for believing the truth. I want us to also hold each other accountable for continuing to go to God's word, to find the truth. I want us to hold each other accountable for taking every thought captive and bringing it to obey Christ and bringing it to the obedience of Christ and his word. I believe we'd be going into great lengths to help ourselves spiritually. If you would go to your life group members and say, hey, I need to constantly be reminded of Matthew chapter 6, verse 30 through 34. I need to constantly be reminded of Romans chapter 8, verse 28. One of the things, obviously, you hear me say a lot here at Midtown Too Much is that we're a Jesus-centered family on mission that we're a family on the mission together of waging war against everything that the enemy is looking to do in our lives and in 
the world family. Let us fight together to destroy strongholds in our lives and each other's lives that we might be the people that God created us to be.